15. Pray for me this morning. I, I did. I just kind of wore out, to be honest with you. I know I've been on vacation. I'm supposed to be wore out when you go on vacation, are you? But, but I am. Amen. Sometimes you need a vacation to get over your vacation. And uh, I was telling everybody yesterday, Friday, we got about 10 o'clock that morning, and I, I took off driving from down there, and I got home a little after midnight. Uh, so, yeah, I was tired. Drove 13 hours, and then yesterday, so praise God, this one's going to be just basically the Bible, no notes, and we're just going to see what God does with it this morning, but it's a familiar theme, and one we shouldn't have any problem with, so take your Bible there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, last week, or last week, it was week, two weeks ago, we talked about the gospel, we preached the verses 1 through 10, and we looked at, Paul talked about the gospel, amen, his gospel, amen, our gospel, for this age of grace, amen, that Jesus died according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and then He rose again according to the Scripture. And it wasn't just that Jesus died. We talked about it was how Jesus died according to the Scriptures. That word how is so important. Because like we said, if they had taken Him into a room somewhere and put a bag over His head and strangled the life out of Him, we wouldn't have salvation. He had to die by His hands and feet being pierced and His blood running down, down His feet Amen. He had to be nailed to a cross. If he had been taken somewhere and clubbed to death, it wouldn't have been. Our, it wouldn't have bought our salvation. It had to have been according to the Word of God. The Word of God is so powerfully important. 
And uh, this morning, let, let's go ahead. We're going to read. We'll read the passage that we're going to look at this morning. But then we're going to we're going to go from there. And I'm going to take us in a little bit of different direction. Look there, verses 12 through 20, and we'll read those, and we'll pray, and we'll get into the message. The Bible says there, begin, beginning in verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life we have hope in Christ, only, I'm sorry, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, I love you. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Jesus, that you have risen. I thank you that you are my risen Lord and Savior. I thank you this morning that you called me to preach. Lord, you've got me here at this appointed hour behind this pulpit of wood. And I pray this morning for the power of the Holy Spirit to come up and set upon me. Lord, fill me, control me, speak through me. These lips are yours. I yield them to you. Please take them and do as you will. Glorify Jesus. Magnify my Savior. Holy Spirit, please give me unction and power. And I plead, I plead not just for myself, but for every listening ear under this message. Lord, let us stress the importance this morning of the resurrection of my Lord and Savior. And Father, I thank you ahead of time because, Lord, I know you'll move. Lord, I know this, is, this pleases you. Lord, I know it excites heaven when to preach on this subject. So, Lord, I pray this morning that you'll give us all the power that we need. And, Lord, speak to hearts today, both in the room and watching, listening in. Lord God, please do a work in us that we could not possibly do on our own. We ask it now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We have glory. I don't know how long I'm going to preach. don't know how short I'm going to preach. We're just going to see what happens. Amen. But I want to talk to you this morning. This is a good time as any to bring this subject up. But I want to talk about the fundamentals of the faith. Amen. This seems like a good spot for me, again, to park on this as any. But So let's talk this morning. And, I, and before I start... Let me explain to you what a fundamental is if you have no idea. Let me just say, first of all, I am a fundamentalist. I am a fundamentalist Christian. Amen? And that, some people don't know what that means. You might say, well, I've heard that word tied in with Muslims and stuff. Fundamentalist Muslims. Can I tell you, you can have a fundamentalist anything? Yep. The word fundamentalist is not a scary word. It's a, it's a word that describes that you believe in the basics of something, and without those basics, it wouldn't exist. I can tell you that I, I believe in the fundamentals of basketball, even though I don't play basketball. I believe you got to dribble. That's a fundamental. Did you know if you don't dribble, it's walking? Yeah, that's not. Uh, you do that, you're not playing basketball. Okay? Did you know you don't shoot with your feet? If you kick the ball in the goal, that's not, that's not legal. That's not a fundamental of basketball. Dribbling is. Did you know shooting the ball is fundamental? Without the, if you don't shoot the ball, you can't score points. So shooting the ball is fundamental basketball. Okay? Let's talk about automobiles this morning. If I go out and get in my pickup truck, I, I, I crank it up so the key is fundamental. It won't start without a key. All right? You've got to have a key to start the automobile unless you know how to hotwire, but that's besides the point. Okay? But I get in there and I turn on the air conditioner. Is the air conditioner fundamental to an automobile? Can I drive that automobile down the road without air conditioning? Yes. So the air conditioner is not a fundamental. It's a luxury. Okay? I, I turn on my radio. This is my radio. Is the radio a fundamental to an automobile? No. No. Is the battery fundamental to an automobile? Yes. It ain't going to crank without the battery. It's fundamental. Amen? Hey, it, is the carburetor fundamental to an automobile? Mm -hmm. It won't get no gas to go down the road without it. See? So you see, anything that makes something what it is, is a fundamental piece, right? So you cannot you cannot build it without the fundamental building blocks of what that is. So this morning we're going to take and look at the fundamentals of our faith. 
the fundamentals of what we believe. Again, this is as good a place to do it as any that I've found. So we're going to look, and, 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 and I'm going to look at five this morning. You could probably argue that there's more than five, but we're going to look at five this morning. Five fundamentals of Christianity. Amen? And I'm going to begin right off the bat. I'm just going to jump right in this. we got about 15, 20 minutes. I think we can do it. All right? The five fundamentals. Number one, without this, you don't have Christianity. That's the deity. That's the God, Godship of our Lord Jesus Christ. What do you say? I'm saying Jesus Christ is not just the Son of God. He is God. Amen? You have God the Father, you have God the Son, and you have God the Holy Ghost. They are all three God. You say the Holy Ghost is God. He's as much God as the Father is God. The Son is as much God as the Father is God. The Son is as much God as the Holy Ghost is God. You say, how do you separate them? You can't. But they're all three distinct. The Father is not the Son. The Father is not the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is not the Father. He's not the Son. They're all separate, but they're all three one. You say, I don't, I can't wrap my head around that. Well, you're not the first, but that's okay. Some things we trust and believe by faith, we don't have to be able to understand it completely with our human mind. Amen? I, again, I, I don't understand how a, 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 a brown cow can eat green grass and get white milk, but it happens, so I don't question some things. Amen? So the deity of our Lord Jesus. Well, how do we know about it? We go to the Word of God, and we read what the Word of God says. In John 1.1, 1, 1, the most definitive verse, I think, in the beginning was the Word. He was in the beginning. The Word, that's Jesus, okay? And you're going to see that. But in the beginning was the Word. Jesus wasn't a created being. God did not create Jesus. God the Father didn't say, hmm, I think I'd like to have a son. Let me make him. No, in the beginning he was there with God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen? The Bible says all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Who? Jesus, the Word of God. He's always existed. Amen? Even in eternity past, before there was a world, before there was anything, Jesus has always existed. He was there in the Old Testament, amen? He was there at the door of Lot. When he, there were three angels that appeared, one of them was Jesus. He was there in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The fourth man in the fire was Jesus. Amen. John 8, 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, which means truly, truly, I say unto you, before Abraham was... I am. You remember in the in the garden when the soldiers came to arrest him, and he he asked, "Whom whom seekest thou?" And they said, "Jesus of Nazareth." And he said, "I am He." And when he said, "I am," they fell backwards, knocked them down. Why? Because I believe when he said, "I am He," His glory was revealed just for a second. And they couldn't stand it. Boom! Knocked them over. Amen. That's real power. That ain't Benny Hinn swinging his. Thousand dollar coat power. This is real power. Knock them flat. Amen. Jesus said, "I am." He is God. He is the Lord. In John ten verse thirty, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, where on eternal security, Jesus said in verse thirty, He said, "I and my Father are one. We're one." Hey, you can't you can't say, "Well, they're at odds on this." No. They're in perfect harmony. Amen. When Jesus walked this earth, He walked it in perfect harmony with His Father. He spent hours of time in prayer, in communication, in fellowship with His Father. He didn't do anything His Father didn't tell Him to do, yet He fulfilled everything that His Father sent Him to do. They are one in perfect harmony. Jesus Christ is God. And if you try to monkey with that, you try to mess with that, you try to make it fit any other way, you don't have Christianity. He is the central theme of everything that we know and have. Amen? The whole, the whole Bible, this whole Bible, amen, is one gigantic flashing arrow pointing Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Would you all agree with that? Amen. amen. I thought I'd clear that up this morning. Amen. Without Him, you don't have Christianity. Then we'll look at the second one. There's the virgin birth. I 
love this King James Bible. Amen. You know why? It says, therefore, a virgin shall conceive. Mm -hmm. yep. But you find one of these other versions, mm -hmm. one of these little Mickey Mouse kitty versions, that's what I think they are, because they're not the Bible. They, they, if people got one, they got a toy in their lap. It ain't real. Amen. It's not the Bible. They say a young woman. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of pregnant young women in my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. You know how they got that way? It wasn't no miracle. <laughs> it was low morals and no standards. But I'm going to tell you something. It wasn't no miraculous conception. Amen. But in the case of Mary, she was already betrothed to Joseph to be married. And he found out that she was already pregnant. But he didn't freak out. God spoke to him. God spoke to her. And, when God, and, and, and it was fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Isaiah 7, 14. Listen to what it says. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Boy. A virgin shall conceive. A virgin shall conceive. Only God can do that. Only God can cause a virgin to be pregnant. She's never been with a man. She, she's a virgin. And the Bible says she'll conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That means God with us. Amen. God with us. God, how did God get here? A virgin conceived. Something that couldn't take place unless Almighty God made it happen. Miraculous. Amen. Everything about God, everything about Christ is miraculous. Amen. Matthew 1, 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Luke 1, 27, the Bible says, To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. You say, how did that possibly happen? Well, Luke 1, 35 tells us, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. How did it happen? The Holy Spirit of God moved upon her. Just very much in the same way that he moved upon the face of the waters in the beginning. He began to work and do his miraculous work. And when he came and moved upon Mary, he did miraculous work. The Bible said, The power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which is born in thee shall be called the Son of God. And you say, well, why does that matter? It matters. Listen, you can't get Christianity unless she was a virgin. I suppose you know why, but there may be somebody that don't understand. Well, let me explain to you. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, and everybody got the same first parents. I ain't nobody here got no different parents. I don't care. You look at somebody, and they may be white as a ghost. You may look at somebody, and they're black as a ace of spades, but it don't make no difference. We got the same parents all the way back. And in the beginning back there when God created Adam and Eve, well, they messed up. Eve, she, she got off away from Adam, went to listening to a, a serpent in a tree trying to tempt her to not believe what God had said and, and saying, you know, even though God, did God really say that? Did he really say you can't eat of this fruit, this fruit of the tree of knowledge and evil, of good and evil? And the one that eats that, they'll, their eyes will be open and then they'll, they'll know all about sin. But he made it look pretty to them, didn't he? Come and have a bite. And because of that, Adam began to die. Eve began to die. All of us in this room are dying right now. All of us in here have got a terminal disease called life. And you let it progress far enough, every one of us will be held stones at the old top of us. Can't get around it. It's, it's back to life. We're all dying. All because of what they did. The first man, because of the first Man, sin entered in, and because of that, we're all condemned. But then again, there was the second Adam that came, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? And because of him, sin has been destroyed and put down. And it was only because he was pure and perfect. The only way he could be pure and perfect born into this world is if he came into this world without a sin nature. 
Amen. If he had had an earthly father, he would have inherited that sin nature from his earthly father. But because he, 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 he came from the heavenly father down in the earth, and the Holy Spirit of God caused him to be implanted into the womb of Mary, he had no earthly father. He carried no pain of sin. Therefore, he was perfect in all his ways. He had a perfect body. He was perfect anyway. He was, a, he was God. But God in a perfect body, a perfect vessel, walked on this earth and was limited and subjected to every temptation that you and I are subjected to. He had every human limitation on Him, but yet He walked this earth in the power of God and He walked it sinlessly. Amen. And He fulfilled everything that God in this Old Testament had prophesied that He would fulfill. He did it exactly down to the last thing, which was saying, I thirst from the cross, which he rather probably wasn't even thirsty, but he had to say it to fulfill the Scripture. He didn't want a mouthful of vinegar. I know he didn't. But he did it for you and me so that the Scripture would be fulfilled. He didn't need it, by the way. He only did it to fulfill the Scripture. <clears throat> that's essential. If we take that, I mean, there's this, you, you, you might think, well, that's just, that's, just, that's just the way it's supposed to be, right? That's just what we preach. Yeah, I can find you a church in this town that don't believe that. I guarantee you I can find you somebody, uh, some liberal in this town somewhere that don't believe that Jesus is born of a virgin. There's all kinds of theories, but I'm going to take the Word of God. I don't care what the theory says. And then the third thing, i got to hurry or I'll run out of time this morning. So you had, you had the deity that Jesus is God, and then you have the fact that his birth was miraculous birth, born of a virgin, and then you have the third one, which is the blood atonement. What does that mean? Well, I was just looking this morning, and they were talking, I was watching about the day of atonement. By the way, guess what the day is? It's Yom Kippur, which is the day of atonement in Israel. Okay? <clears throat> Of course, they don't temple, and they're not practicing all those things, but today is that day. It's kind of interesting that it is that day. But what would the priest do on the Day of Atonement? He would take the blood of the Lamb, he would get out of his priestly garb, he'd put on a white garb, and he'd wash in pure water, and he'd wear linen breeches, and, and he had a, the garment had bells at the bottom of it. You heard me talk about this. A pomegranate, golden pomegranates and bells at the bottom. He had a rope around his waist. He went up with a labor of blood into the Holy of Holies. He walked up to the to the to the uh, Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat with the angel's wings are leaning over the mercy seat on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, and he'd take that blood and he'd sprinkle it seven times upon that mercy seat, making an atonement for the sins of Israel for that year. Only one day of the year he would go in and do that. And the reason for the rope and the bells is because if he'd go in and he wasn't right with God, he dropped dead right there. And nobody could go in after him, so they'd have to pull him out with that rope. Now he did that every year for a covering of sin. But it wouldn't take sin away, it covered sin. Now, he did that with the blood of a lamb, a perfect, spotless lamb. Jesus, when he died on the cross of Calvary, he was dying as the Lamb of God, as John the Baptist said. Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He proclaimed it there by the Jordan River, that he was the sacrifice for sin. So when they nailed him to that cross, amen, and the blood was pouring down his body, he was there dying, the lamb, the sacrifice. His blood was being shed, just as that lamb on the day of atonement would have been shed with the knife of the priest and poured out. Jesus was shedding his blood as both our priest and the lamb itself. At the same time, he was making an atonement once forever for all sin. And we, by believing on that sacrifice, believing that he died was sacrificed for sin, but not yet, not, that's not all of it, and we'll see that that's not all of it. We know that's not all of it. But he did. He was sacrificed for our sins. The Bible says in Acts 20, 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Never forget how valuable you are. Never. I don't care what the devil tells you. I don't care what nobody else tells you. They can tell you you're worthless and you don't amount to anything. But I'm here to tell you something, good neighbor. If you've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, you're worth everything in the world of God because it cost the blood of his own son to pay for you. So you're very precious to God. And don't you ever forget that. 
Romans 3, 25, For God had set, forth, had set Him forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. We're not tr- listen, we're not trusting religion. We're trusting the blood. Amen? The blood. The blood is what washed your sins away. Amen? It's not your prayer you prayed. That didn't do nothing. Amen? It's not the water in the baptistry that washed sins away. It's the blood of Jesus when you put your faith in it. Amen? When you trust Him that the blood had the power to wash your sins away, to renew them so you can stand righteous and holy and pure in the presence of God Almighty. God did that for you. To declare His righteousness, not yours. To declare that He's able to make you righteous. For the remission of sins that are past, they're gone through the forbearance of God. Romans 5, 9, much more than being now justified. That means made right. Uh, legal standing. We're made right. There's no more, there's no more, uh, 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 there's no more marks against us. There's no, nothing on our account against us. We've been made justified. Think the record has been set straight. How? Justified by His blood. Nothing we can do could ever make the payment. There's nothing. You, you could be sorry from here on out, cry weak forevermore, do all the work you can, try to help all the people you can do, but it won't do it. None of that matters. The blood is what God required. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins or no forgiveness of sin. It's only by trusting that Jesus' blood has been shed. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood. That means things have been made right between us and God. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Grace, G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. Hebrews 9, 12 through 14. The Bible says, Neither by the blood of goats or calves. You see, all the lambs that were slain, all, all the animals that were slain didn't do a thing, but by His own blood He entered in once into the holy place. Again, He went and carried His own blood. You remember in the garden, the the women came there and He said, Don't touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. He had to take the blood and apply it to the mercy seat. The Bible says, For the bull of blood and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the puring of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. That blood is essential. Without the blood, you have nothing. Without the blood, all you have is men trying to, trying to clean themselves up and make themselves look good for each other. We can't do a thing to miss hell without the blood of Jesus. Without the blood of Jesus, every soul is going to fall right into the pit of hell. It has to be the blood. Now, like I said, there are two that we could cover for the sake of we could cover, but for the sake of time, we won't. And one of those is the second coming of Christ. He's coming again. Without that, you don't have everything. Okay? With that, and we talked about the second coming quite a bit. And the other is the church and her mission. Amen? He sent the church into all the world. If we don't go and do what God told us to do, we don't have Christianity either. But we don't have time to talk about all that. So we're going to get to the fifth one. And that's the bodily resurrection. Luke 24, 36 through 46. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of him, them, and said unto them, Peace be unto you. This is after his death and his burial. And they are gathered again in that upper room. And they're there hiding out. They're, fear, they're afraid because they're afraid the Jews are going to come and nail them to a cross. They did that to Jesus, and they're going to do it. They're liable to do it to us, so they're hiding out. And Jesus, they're sitting there, and there wasn't a knock at the door. Well, no, I wonder who that is. No, it's just all of a sudden, poof! Jesus is standing right in the middle of the room. Where did he come from? Ah! They scared him. He scared the living daylight. You know how I know it says right there in verse thirty-seven. But they were terrified and affrighted. Not just terrified, but terrified and afraid. I don't know what the difference is. But they were both. <laughs> Amen. That's like I used to, they met me behind the bleachers when I was a little kid. He said, you want to die quick and fast? I don't know what quick and fast, how the difference was, but he he going to put both of them on me. But anyway, listen, so he was terrified and afraid. So I don't think you could calm them down real easy. 
I think they didn't know whether they was coming or going. They didn't know whether to, whether to jump or to duck. I don't think they knew what to do. I think they were just just standing there shaking like a leaf on a tree. Supposing they had seen a spirit. They all thought it was a ghost. Ah! I figured some of that went on, don't you reckon? There's a bunch of, bunch of grown men like a bunch of little girls going, Ah! 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 What are we going to do? Ah! It's a ghost! And Jesus said, why are y'all troubled? <laughs> What's wrong with y'all? Why do, why do thoughts arise in your hearts? <laughs> Jesus is so mild-mannered about it all. What's the big deal, yet, guys? Come on now. Don't be upset. He says, behold my hands and my feet. Look here, it's me. It's I myself. Handle me. Look how Jesus is. He's not standoffish at all, is he? He's saying, listen, Come here and touch me. It's really me. I want you to come here and feel of me. Feel of these places where they drove the nail. Feel my feet. Feel of me. Check me out and make sure that you know this is me. He said, listen. He said, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. Now notice something's missing there. Did you hear that? A spirit hath not flesh and bones which you see me have. What was missing? Blood. Blood. You know why? He shed it on Calvary. Amen. So how do you lie? He's God. That's how. Amen. Hey, he said, look here. See my, see my flesh and bones. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And listen, the Bible said, while they, while they yet believed not for joy, they, they still was not real sure yet. <laughs> and they wondered. They were apprehensive as they could be. I, I could see them all just kind of sneaking up there. Touching the hands, you know. Ah! I touched that spot where it's nailed up. Ah! Woo! <laughs> That's kind of how it was, sister. <laughs> I think it's a little bit scared. Amen. He said unto him, he said, well, hey, y'all got any meat? That's an interesting question. I'm wondering right in the middle of all that. <laughs> Touch me. Ah! Ah! Y'all got anybody to eat? <laughs> and they said, they, uh, somebody brought him, I said, they're shaking with a plate in their hand, got some raw fish on it. A piece of honeycomb, what an odd combination in my opinion, but hey, I'm not, I didn't fix the plate. But anyway, fish and honeycomb. Here! And they got it out there to him, and, he, and they gave him a piece of raw fish and of a honeycomb, and he took it and he ate it before. And he said unto them, These are the words that I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the Law of Moses and in the Prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Again, everything had to be done just like it was said. And I know you didn't understand that before. But now I hope you see that. The Bible said, Then opened he to their understanding. He turned the light on in their thinking. And they went, Oh, of course. Makes sense now when Jesus... Hey, listen. And by the way, can I tell you something? You can't turn the light on for yourself. But you can come to God and say, God, there's some things I don't understand about Christianity yet. There's some things I don't understand about the Word of God. But Lord, I sure wish you'd show me. You know, if you if you go to God daily and pray those kind of things, you know God will open your understanding. God, 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 the Bible says He takes a simple man and makes him a wise man. So that kind of happens. God does that. You don't do it. God does it. But, but praise God, He opened their understanding. And all of a sudden they got it, that they might understand the Scriptures. And He said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus... It behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Yes, it's written. And again, Paul declared it. He said, he said that I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. I got it from Jesus, and I'm giving it to you. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He did it exactly as it was prophesied. And that He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Again, everything has to be done according to the Scriptures because the inerrancy of the Scriptures is a part of this. If that book right here, let me tell you something. If this book right here is not the Word of God, then we ain't got no faith. But this book's right. This book is the Word of God. And it is inerrant. That means there are no errors in it. Amen? Now, I, if I was holding up the NIV this morning, I could have said that. 
because there's plenty of errors. If I had a hold of, of a revised standard version, I couldn't say that because there's plenty of errors. If I had the New American Standard Version, I couldn't say that because there's plenty of errors. If I had the New King James Version, I couldn't say that because there's plenty of errors. Amen. Amen. I mean, you can name any of them. Good, good news for modern man, a living Bible, you know, a new century version, call, uh, Christian, what is it, uh, the, the Holman Standard Bible, the, the CSB or whatever they just put out, the ESB. You, I mean, you can name them all. This is the only one. This is God's Word for the English-speaking people. And it has to be according to the Scripture. If you monkey around with it, you mess Christianity up. Now to our text, and we're closing. Verse 12. Paul says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there's no resurrection from the dead? There are people in the church of Corinth who are saying, He didn't raise from the dead. He didn't rise from the dead. How is there people in a Christian church saying such things? I don't think I know. That church was full of Jews and Gentiles who had been saved. And amongst the Jews, you had two religious classes. You had the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees very much believed in the resurrection. They believed in angels. They believed in, in, in a lot of things. And Paul, Paul had been a Pharisee, and Paul could reason with them often because he had been one and like-minded with them. But there were people in that church that were, that were members of the, the upper echelon of believers the snooty of elite class, and those people were, were very worldly-minded, and they did not believe in a resurrection. When you died, you died, and that was it. That's a sad thing to believe that. They didn't get that out of the Word of God. They got that out of their own dumb teaching. But yet there were people in that church, it blows my mind, that there were literally people in that church who claimed to be believers, Brother Lucas, but yet they say Jesus didn't raise from the dead. So Paul, he says, okay, well let's just look at it from their point of view for a second. If there is no resurrection from the dead, if ain't nobody, if, 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 if ain't nobody coming out of them graves, then Christ didn't raise them. And he said, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. It's, what are we doing preaching then? If Jesus did come up out of that grave, we're wasting our breath. And you know what? And you coming to church is stupid because your faith is empty and stupid and worthless if Jesus didn't come out of that grave. I mean, if he didn't come up out of that grave, why are you here? And he says... In verse 15, and we are found false witnesses of God. That would make us liars because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. So if you're right, then everything we've been talking about, everything we've been doing is a waste of time. And he said, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, if Jesus is still dead, then your faith is dead. Your faith is vain. It's empty. It's worthless. Your faith is in you, not in Jesus. That's what he's saying. You're, you're trusting in you, not him. And he said, and you're yet in your sins. You're dead and on your way to hell if Jesus is raised. Then they which are also are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. They're all, they're all gone too. They ain't coming out either if Christ be not raised. And I like what he said in verse 19 and 20. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. If we're just going through the motion pretending like we got faith, pretending like this is real. If we're just doing this and there's really nothing at the end, if Jesus wasn't raised, then we're going through the motions for something silly that won't ever even turn out. That's ridiculous. But, now is Christ raised from the dead? That's the truth. 
Amen. <laughs> and become the first fruits of them that slip. And all that means is this. He came out. Guess what? If we die, we're coming out too. Amen. Amen. He's, he's become the first fruits. The Bible says that, that, that in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, hey, the dead in Christ shall rise first. You know what? We that are alive remain shall not prevent, which means go before them which have died. But we'll, we'll be changed in a moment in a twinkle of an eye and be caught up together with them in the, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the, in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. But so, so it's the first fruits. Listen again, we're not going, when the, when the trumpet sounds, we're not going up immediately. The, the dead in Christ are coming up first. Amen. So why is that? Well, they've been in there a long time. It's time for them to come up. Amen? And it's going to happen so quick, you won't know the difference. You won't know who goes first. Amen? Because it's going to happen so quick. Amen? And it ain't going to be long. It ain't going to be long. I heard a preacher say one time, you know, I don't know why people wear these crosses around their neck. He said, if I was going to wear anything, I'd wear an empty tomb around mine. Amen? Because without the empty tomb, the cross is... It's null and void. What really makes the difference is that he came out. And I know it ain't Easter Sunday morning, but that don't make no difference. Every Sunday morning is Resurrection Sunday morning to me. Amen. Every day I wake up, I'm reminded that he did all this for me. And it's all real. And it all has happened exactly the way he said it was going to happen. It's all been done the way he said it was had to be done. Amen. And my salvation is bought and it's paid for and it was free and I received it by grace and I'll never lose it. And glory, hallelujah, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. And someday when the trumpet sounds, I'm going home. Amen. I hope you're saved. I hope you know for sure. I hope there's no doubt in your mind. I didn't preach this this morning because I thought anybody was lost this morning. But if there's somebody under the sound of my voice that is lost, and you've never trusted that Jesus has done everything for you and paved the way for you, I urge you to come this morning and get saved. Listen, if you're here this morning and you need to be baptized, I urge you to come and do that. If you're not joining the church and you want to make our church a church home, I urge you to do that. Whatever a person needs to do. There's people listening to me this morning on this internet and they need to make decisions for God. There may be somebody lost listening to me. And listen, friend, all you've got to do is trust Him and believe on Him and ask Him to save you. No magic words, no magic formula. It's believing. Amen. Zacchaeus climbed up in a tree and he believed up there. And I don't recall anywhere reading where he prayed. Amen. He just believed. That's what it takes is believing and trusting in what God is doing. Let's stand together. Sister, if you come to the piano, we're going to sing number 151. 151. Father in heaven, Lord, we just love you so much. Thank you, Lord, for being our God. Thank you that this morning that you sent Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you that he did all that was necessary. All that was necessary for us. Lord God, I just pray, Father, that you have mercy. And Lord, that you speak during this invitation. Speak to hearts, Lord. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Sister, I told you the wrong number. Turn to 337. 337. 337. Trust and obey. The Lord speak to your heart this morning about something. Come and do business with Him. And let's, let's, let's say. 337. When we
bless you and help you to, uh, Lord, lead you to be a, be a blessing to somebody else, to be a, a minister to somebody else's troubles, to be a witness to somebody else's darkness. God can use you in, in many ways if you make yourself available. Let's stay close to Him and let's stay ready to be a, a blessing to others.